afternoon, uh, everybody, and uh, thanks, Brian, for that warm welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, uh, somewhat daunting, actually, to see so much experience in, in one room. I, I feel kind of uh, humbled, and I'm sure I'm probably the least experienced pilot in the room. I'm about to give you a, a, a talk about flying. Today I'm going to uh, show you a flight that I took back in June of this year um, from Jandicott to Murrayfield in a Rakwa Cessna 172. The flight was at night and the last lingering vestiges of a cold front were just um, passing through, enough to warrant planning IFR, um, but as, as it turned out the forecast was um, somewhat pessimistic and as usual it turned out to be uh, quite a nice VFR night. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a brief uh, overview of uh, GPS technology as it applies to aviation. Go through the flight preparation that I uh, did for this particular flight with emphasis on uh, GPS aspects of it and show you some actual video footage uh, from the preparation and from the flight itself. I need to warn you that I'm uh, not an instructor and I'm also not an expert on uh, GPS. I'm approaching this more from a pilot's perspective. My, my knowledge is limited um, basically to what a pilot needs to know to uh, pass the GPS component of a command instrument rating. I'm happy to take questions along the way, um, but as we're a little limited for time, it might be safer just to leave them till the end and see how we uh, fit them in. Once I start one of the videos, um, it's a little bit awkward to pause it, so if you wouldn't mind just waiting until the end of, uh, of a video segment before you ask a question. GPS system um, was originally developed and launched by the United States Department of Defense. There are two levels of precision, the standard one that um, is available to all users and a precise uh, level of accuracy which is limited to uh, military users and other qualified users. The standard precision has an accuracy of at least 36 meters uh, with a probability of 95% or better and it's more than accurate enough for flying. Um, the satellite availability and accuracy is predictable to some degree, and we'll talk a little bit later on about uh, rain prediction. The GPS system consists of three segments. Uh, the space segment, which uh, is obviously the satellites, the, ground, uh, the control segment, which are the ground stations, and uh, the uh, user segment, which is the receiver that we have in our aircraft. Uh, there are 24 satellites in the constellation. Uh, four per um, plane in six planes. They orbit in a relatively low orbit of about 20,000 uh, kilometres above the Earth's surface, travelling at about four kilometres per second and orbiting the uh, Earth every 11 hours and 58 minutes. Each satellite sends a very precise digital message containing um, a thing called the almanac, which is the general details about the rising and setting times of all of the satellites in the constellation. And it also sends uh, information called the ephemeris, which is accurate details of its own position. And it also sends the system time and real time details about the accuracy and the health of the system. Each satellite contains a very accurate atomic clock. The accuracy of um, the system uh, and the health of the system is monitored by um, control stations on the ground. At the moment, there's uh, one master station in uh, near Colorado Springs in Colorado, and uh, not at the moment, but they're uh, working towards having uh, 11 control, control stations around the world, um, with each satellite visible to at least uh, three control stations at any point in time. So they uh, monitor the uh, health of the system and they update the ephemeris data in each of the satellites. Now the receiver locks onto as many satellite signals as it can and works out a position by triangulation. Since the relative position of the satellites are known, by determining the difference in each time signal, uh, or the, the, the difference that the t um, in time that the signal takes to reach the receiver, uh, the position of the receiver can be calculated. Now it takes a minimum of four satellites to calculate a three-dimensional position. Um, we communicate with the receiver by um, a database of waypoints that are based on latitudes and longitudes, and so as, we, as pilots we interact with it in terms of our normal uh, map references and place names. Accuracy of the GPS system is affected by a combination of factors. Even if there were four ideally located satellites, there are still errors possible due to um, what are called ephemeris errors, which are basically deviations of the satellite from where it says it's supposed to be. And that, that's relatively small in the order of one to two metres. 
um, clock errors um, can occur in both the satellite and in the receiver, and they can also contribute up to uh, two meter uh, error in position. Um, because of the relatively weak signal that's coming from the satellites, um, it's quite easy for the signal to become distorted and the receiver signal noise can add another um, meter or so of inaccuracy. The biggest um, factor of all affecting um, the accuracy of uh, GPS is the ionospheric um, effect. Um, basically because as the signal travels through the ionosphere, it, it gets slowed down. So obviously the amount of slowing varies depending on how um, low to the horizon um, the satellite might be. And it's also affected by solar activity. The receiver constantly monitors um, the availability of satellites to make sure that there are enough. IFR receivers, which is what we'll be flying with in this flight, need to go one step further. They use a fifth satellite or a barometric input to internally cross-check um, multiple position calculations one against the other. And this is referred to as RAIM, or Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. The responsibility of the receiver to alert the pilot if it detects a problem um, with the position accuracy. Receivers meeting the requirement for IFR must have RAIM capabilities, so we need um, at least five satellites or four satellites and a barometric input. Um, anything less than that and the system will give you a warning and potentially cause you to um, abort your instrument approach. Uh, we have the ability to predict RAIM based on you know, what we know about the um, almanac um, and that's known as RAIM prediction. When RAIM is not available it's known as a RAIM hole and that kind of happens locally um, probably up to a few minutes every other day in southern WA. Uh, it's manageable because the, um, the RAIM holes are forecast and they're predictable. So RAIM prediction is, is a very important part of flight preparation and we get a, a RAIM prediction from air services um, based on the published almanac. So that's all the dry stuff. The um, receiver that we're um, going to be using in, in this flight is the uh, Bendix King KLN 89B. Um, you see a photo of it there installed in uh, the panel of a Cessna 172R. And the journey um, is basically from Jernicott to Murray Field. Most of you would know that Murray Field is uh, Rackwas Satellite Airport about um, 10 kilometres northeast of Mantra. If we were going to go by car, we'd go straight down the freeway. So leaving Jandicott, heading to Murray Field. And these um, excerpts here are from um, the IRSA, or en route supplement, where we get important information such as the uh, runway length, um, there, elevation, um, frequency for turning on the lights, CTAF frequency, uh, noise abatement rules, um, circuit direction, important stuff like that, that um, we, we need to know before we plan a flight like this. We're anticipating arriving on runway 23, which is the long bitumized uh, runway at Murray Field. Okay, a few definitions about IFR. Um, because this was a night flight on a day with some rain and cloud in the vicinity, we were, uh, the intention was to uh, lodge an instrument flight plan and prepare for an RNAV um, instrument approach at Murray Field. Um, instrument approach, as most of you would know, a published and certified approach for landing in non-visual conditions. RNAV, um, the term that you've heard me banding about, stands for area navigation. So an RNAV approach is just an instrument approach using area navigation. Um, probably people here who could define this better than I can, but my understanding is that uh, RNAV um, basically applies to any um, approach that doesn't require terrestrial radio nav aids such as uh, NDBs, VORs and ILSs, which um, you'd be familiar with if you'd flown instrument um, or IFR in the past. And I believe it was originally coined for uh, self-contained inertial systems in, in uh, um, regular public transport, but they use the term equally to apply to uh, self-contained um, satellite-based systems um, these days. Now the other terms um, that have been used in the past, uh, GPS is actually the brand name of, um, of the US military. There are other types of um, satellite systems, but um, Originally, uh, these were called GPS uh, non-precision approaches. Then they updated the name to uh, GNSS um, to allow for the, uh, the possibility of, of systems other than the United States military system. And uh, now we call them the RNAV approach. 
This is the aircraft, Cessna 172, call sign Romeo Whiskey Tango, and as I mentioned before, flying with the KLN 89B. So, 55 kilometres by road, 40 nautical miles by air. Why so long, you ask? Well, we have to um, basically take this slightly circuitous route, the uh, standard instrument departure up here to Fremantle, then the en route portion, and then we have um, a selection of options uh, once we uh, invoke the actual RNAV approach. We can uh, start it via Waypoint Alpha, Bravo or Charlie, and as we're coming from the uh, northeast, obviously Alpha's the, uh, the logical choice. Um, this is the official um, RNAV approach plate, um, similar kind of diagram as we just saw. The proper names for these things are actually um, MUL E for east because the approach comes from the east and then an identifying uh, final letter so we refer to this one as Echo Alpha. So you'll um, hear it referred to later on in, in the presentation as um, you know commencing the approach at the initial approach point of uh, Echo Alpha. If we started here it would be Echo Bravo and Echo Charlie down there. And basically the approach would be to fly in here on a, a track of 158, turn right onto 228 at India and uh, it flies us straight in, um, basically aligned with runway 23 at Murray Field. Now, um, obviously the approach plate defines exactly what route we're going to take, what altitude we're going to be at every position in the approach, and the minimum descent altitude yeah. here, what we can descend to um, on the day. Um, and it also defines how the approach is uh, aborted if we, uh, have a, uh, if we don't get visual at the minima. And the missed approach details are here, track direct to um, Echo Hotel, turn left, track 070, climb to 3100. So, flight planning. This, in the good old days, we could we used to be able to walk into the uh, briefers office here at Jandicott and um, actually discuss the weather for our upcoming flight with a real person. Um, while it's still possible to talk to somebody by phone, they don't make it that easy. And uh, nowadays we have the internet um, at our disposal. So basically I'm just show, I'm showing a few slides of the process that I go through to um, prepare for an IFR flight using the internet. Um, this is the Air Services Australia um, website, and we're uh, looking for the forecast in Area 60. This is the actual forecast from the 29th of June when, when this flight was to occur. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with an area forecast, but I kind of run you through the, uh, the salient points. Uh, that first part north of Dongra didn't really apply. Isolated showers southwest of Calberry Southern Cross until 6 p.m. My ETD uh, was 5.30pm, uh, so that was uh, relevant. Um, we uh, slotted in here to area B. Uh, winds at 3,210 degrees at 15 knots. And uh, the cloud, which I was obviously interested in. Some broken stratus from 1,000 to 3,000 in showers of rain. And some um, broken cumulus from 3,000 to 8,000. Uh, the second part of that forecast, the amended part, overrides um, the common parts on the previous page, but the difference is here that we have to take into account um, basically the amended visibility, potentially five kilometres in showers of rain near the coast. Uh, I have to be concerned about freezing level, but we were going down below 7,000, so that wasn't an issue, and icing um, was not going to be an issue. The terminal area forecast at Jandicott contains an awful lot of information. Um, I won't go through all of that, but um, you know, having a look at this, it kind of concerned me that um, there might have been some weather, and um, I needed to be conscious of some aspects of this. Um, I think this intermittent between 6 a.m. and 2 p.m. that was already that was going to be finished, but basically, uh, light showers of rain, scattered cloud, 2,500 broken at 4,000. Now the other um, um, information that we have at our disposal, other than the air services data, is um, the data that you can just get from the internet for the, from the Bureau of Meteorology. So I've been watching during the day the uh, radar, radar from um, Bureau of Meteorology to see what was going on there, and there are obviously little pockets of rain. This is the uh, satellite photo showing basically the vestiges of a cold front. Um, there's, a tr there's the leading edge of the cold front across there. And um, basically that's confirmed by the barometric chart showing the cold front. 
and um, kind of interested in the uh, southwesterly onshore flow it gives us an idea of which way the wind's going to be coming and how strong it's going to be as well. I talked a little bit earlier about rain prediction. Um, this is the uh, report that you request from air services um, before the flight and um, being a C129 um, GPS in this case, if there had been any um, rain holes, they would have indicated here at what time um, rain would not have been available. So we would have had to be careful to uh, not be depending on the GPS for an approach if there had been any rain outages. So this is my flight log. Um, you'll, he you'll hear the term flight plan, and I'm sure you all know that we, uh, we use flight plan for a, a multitude of sins, but um, this is, some people refer to this as their flight plan. This is, I'm actually gonna call it a flight log just to differentiate it. But that includes routes, um, tracks, headings, altitudes, time intervals, estimated time of arrival, um, fuel calculations, um, and so forth. The other flight plan that we talk about, the one that we submit to um, ATC, um, it's actually called a flight notification, um, notifies them of my departure time, altitudes, the safety equipment that I have on board, my endurance, navigation equipment, and um, aircraft capabilities. This is a little video from out of the window of my apartment in East Perth. Um, it's probably a little bit hard to see there, but you can just see Qantas flying in the clouds. It had obviously been raining during the day. When I arrived at Jandicott, there was a full uh, rainbow and uh, just a patch of blue sky starting over in the uh, southwest, so basically improving weather. Now programming um, the GPS um, is a little bit, well preparation for a GPS flight is a little bit more involved than preparation for a, a standard flight. But waypoints into um, the unit and a GPS um, the en route part of the GPS flight plan involves basically putting in Jandicott and Murray Field. Um, this is the pilot's bible, the uh, um, KLN 89B pilot guide, which goes into an awful lot of detail and takes a little while to uh, become proficient at using one of these things, but once you do, it's not too hard. Um, so far, we're just at this point in, the, uh, in my checklist programming the GPS, and this is basically what it looks like. So using, um, basically, it's a fairly basic kind of interface, a couple of knobs that you turn around and push in and out, and you spell out the letters of the waypoints. It's a little bit hard to read, but you can just see the Jandicott there. Um, I'm entering the uh, SID and this will be um, Murray Field. So that says Murray Field, accept it, and then basically you um, activate that particular flight plan by selecting Use and hitting Enter, and it's done. So when we, um, uh, after we start up, the other thing we have to do is basically um, a series of tests. When, when the unit first starts, it does its own self-test, and we're looking for um, the unit to display 34.5 nautical miles, a half-scale deflection RMI 130, the odds set to whatever it's set on, and the database to be current. Well, this is our uh, GPS um, initialization check, 34.5 nautical miles always, half-scale deflection to the right, uh, RMI 130 odds as set on the uh, F1 VOR, we accept that, accept reference to Jandicott, acknowledge the database is current. And then um, basically we're about to get our clearances and go. Clearance delivery, good evening. Romeo Whiskey Tango on the ground at Jandicott, request clearance. Clearance Whiskey Tango, clearance delivery, clearance traffic to Murray Field, maintain 1500, metal one departure, squat code. Four three two zero. Direct Murray Field one thousand five hundred. The mantle one departure. Score four three two zero. Romeo Whiskey Tanker. Helicopter information. Hotel runway two four left for circuits in departures via Angle. Frequency one one nine eight four. 
I'm at 6 0 8 0 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 I'm at 6 0 8 
We fly that all the way into this point here, which is about 0.9 miles past Echo India, or 4.1 miles before Echo Foxtrot. So you see up here 4.1, 3,100. And then um, basically on a three degree descent profile, um, if we're doing 80 knots ground speed, we'll set it up in a 400 foot per minute descent. And we should be able to mark off each of these distances against the altitude that we're flying and follow that profile um, down accurately until we get to our minimum descent altitude. Um, as I mentioned before, if we don't get uh, a visibility of 2.4 kilometres when we reach the minimum descent altitude, we're obliged to go on the missed approach, track direct to Echo Hotel, turn left, track 070 and climb to 3100. Um, because we're using an area forecast, we actually have to add a 50 foot buffer here, so we're actually only going to descend down to 710 in this approach before we, uh, before we would go missed. As with every uh, instrument approach, we go through a series of um, pre-landing checks, known as the INSYS checks. We're inbound um, to Murrayfield on the uh, RNAV approach. Um, nav aids tuned, identified, tested, slow down to an appropriate speed, we make sure, well, if it was an NDB approach, we'd uh, check our ident. We uh, do a self-brief, run through the approach and the missed approach procedures, and TAF stands for um, you know, just a uh, sanity check of what the uh, wind is doing and which runway we expect to be using. Now, apart for specifically for the RNAV, within 30 miles, the, uh, we need to verify we're in the right mode. The um, arm annunciator should be showing. And as we approach the final approach fix, within two miles of uh, the final approach fix, the mode should change to approach. If it doesn't, we go missed. So they're basically the... Uh, the pre-landing checks for the um, RNAV and um, basically this is the uh, the rest of the flight um, down to the landing. Okay, we're doing our 3100, we're at our Echo Alpha almost. So at this point we're basically flying along the line. Um, we're inbound on the RNAV Echo approach. I'll get this straight in approach on runway 23. Shortly we will be commencing a 10-mile uh, final for runway 23 Murrayfield and we'll be conducting circuits afterwards. Now the, uh, the top um, VOR instrument is slave to the GPS, so that's working as a command instrument. So I'm trying to keep the uh, vertical line um, in the middle. And we're also using the uh, moving map um, on the GPS to show us our route. This flashing light here is um, the turn anticipation, telling me that I'm about to approach this waypoint. And so I'm getting set up to uh, turn onto the new heading of 228. So I've started our turn. Now the last part of the assist checks was the tank. We know that the uh, wind was about 210 at 15 or 20 knots. Uh, it should be pretty much right on the nose. But I'm missing the distance to 2500. You clear for Alice approach from Y24. 2500, clear for Alice, 2-4. We might turn the switch over because we're slightly right of track, so we'll just make a small course adjustment there. And uh, 4.1 from Foxtrot, we commence our descent. Now we're doing 83 knots times 5 is 40 minute descent we're looking for. So what we're trying to do here is uh, cross check the distance to the next waypoint uh, against the altitude. We're two miles, it should change from R to eight, otherwise we go on our mistake. Mr. Proach is trying to hotel, turn left, climb to 3100. So when we get to this point here, and this gets to, to uh, 2450, on the altitude. that should change. And I'm looking for it to go active. It's a little bit hard to read, that says 2.1 now, and you'll see it change to 2.0. There it goes. This light should flip down, it did. And we're at 2450. We're at the right altitude. Going to turn the lights on. Okay, 
Runway two, C plus, one one nine, decimal one. Runway lighting on. So you just see the lights now. Coming down to uh, one mile short of Fox Track, we should be at 2,110. So that's his 1.2. 1.1. So we've got 80 knots uh, ground speed, so these are 2,110. We've got 80 knots ground speed descending at 400 feet a minute, that puts us on the profile. Looks so like we've got the heading just about right. And I get a little distracted here and get off course. You can see the um, course deviation indicator moving off to the left. Once you're within um, uh, the final approach segment, the accuracy of the instrument um, increases. So full scale deflection here of only 0.3 of a mile. Um, so that's not a huge deviation, but um, you'll see I gradually get it back on track. Coming up to our missed approach point, we're um, underneath our 710, so we're a visual at this point. And that's a happy sight to see when you look outside. And we're down. There we go. <laughs>